This lecture is on the analysis of power electronic waveforms. Our objective is to summarize the analysis tools at our disposal for studying power electronic waveforms. These waveforms are periodic in nature, typically, and can include either voltage or current. We're going to start by talking about the average value of a waveform. <clears throat> the average value can be calculated by integrating the waveform x of t, some arbitrary waveform x of t, and dividing that over the fundamental period of that waveform. So let's start by considering the waveform on the top right here, which is a square wave with a load duty cycle. We can calculate the average value based on the area under each of the rectangles. So the first rectangle has an area of delta t, x hat. The second rectangle has an area of delta t negative x hat. So clearly this has an average value of zero. However, if we were to change this waveform so that both pulses are positive, we would then have a non-zero waveform. This would be a positive and we would have a value of 2 delta t over t x hat. We can repeat the same thing with a sinusoid. Here x of t is equal to x hat times the sine of 2 pi over the period times time. Clearly this has a zero average. Next let's talk about the root mean square value. So RMS, this should be a familiar concept to you from your previous coursework. And RMS, again, stands for root mean square. And these are instructions. This is telling you that you are going to take the square root of the mean, and mean is just another word for average, of the square of your signal. So we can write this mathematically as saying that x rms is equal to the square root of the average of our signal squared. All right, let's practice this. Starting again with the same two waveforms. We'll start with the waveform on the, on the top. Here, we're taking the average of the square of this waveform, which will have a magnitude of x hat times x hat, and again, x hat times x hat. So clearly, both of these pulses are now positive because we've squared them. The RMS of this is then calculated, based on our equation, as being the average of the square of that signal. So our first the first square that we have to consider has an area of delta t times x hat squared. And the second area that we must consider has an area of delta t again times x hat squared again. And we can then easily evaluate this as 2 delta t over t x hat squared, the square root of this quantity. We can then calculate the RMS value of a sine wave. So calculating the, a the average of the square of our sine wave, we see that this is the function that we are integrating. Conceptually, we are taking the average of this value that I'm indicating in blue. If we evaluate this integral, we end up getting a familiar result, x hat over the square root of 2. That you can go from the peak of a sinusoid to its RMS value by dividing the peak by square root of 2, or going from the RMS value to the peak of a sinusoid by multiplying by the square root of 2. So notice that I'm emphasizing the word sinusoid that relationship only applies to a pure sinusoid. Next, let's talk about phasors. 
In your previous coursework, you've considered phasors as these complex quantities which have some kind of peak value and a phase angle, and you can graph them on a real imaginary plane. So if we have our y-axis be imaginary and our x-axis be the real axis, we can graph these vectors as having some magnitude, i hat, and some angle, phi. But what does this actually mean? We use phasors to represent sinusoids in a convenient and compact fashion. You've previously learned that you convert from the phasor domain to the time domain by taking the real part of the phasor quantity. We can use Euler's formula to express a quantity in here as i hat times the cosine of omega t plus phi plus j sine omega t plus phi. And clearly the real portion of this is this part of your expression. So all of that is to say that i of t is equal to i hat cosine of omega t plus phi, where i hat is the i hat of your phasor, and the angle is the phase angle of your cosine. But this specifically pertains to a single harmonic. This means that if you represent a phasor as a complex quantity, you're talking about one harmonic that the sinusoid is oscillating at frequency omega. So you're talking about pure sinusoids. However, in power electronics, we're dealing with waveforms that don't necessarily look like, look like sinusoids. And to give you an example here, let's consider the single phase rectifier with an AC voltage supply connected to a DC load. So the load is actually a pure current source drawing pure DC. And if you were to graph your input current, IS, as a function of time, you'd see that it is a square wave so when we, an when we analyze a waveform in the lab, we'll oftentimes plot it with an oscilloscope. And a useful tool is to be able to decompose it into its harmonic content. And the tool that we use with our oscilloscope is called an FFT. So any signal, any periodic signal, can be viewed as consisting of several different sinusoids that are all summed up. And the FFT is a useful way to show the value of each of those sinusoids. This FFT that I'm showing on the right side, you can see that it has it has a harmonic at index 1, it has a harmonic at index 3, a harmonic at index 5, and so on. So this is a useful tool in a laboratory to analyze a waveform, but let's study it analytically. As you're aware, you can use a Fourier series to decompose any periodic waveform into its harmonic components in the form that I've written on the slide here. What does this mean? Well, it means that if you if you have some waveform, I'm going to try to sketch this on our graph here, uh, g of t, it can be viewed as a sum of sinusoids. I've drawn the first two sinusoids um, in blue and in red. So the first sinusoid is the fundamental, that's the harmonic index 1. The red sinusoid has a frequency of twice, the first sinusoid. And if we look at the complete waveform, it's going to look something something kind of like like this and so on. And it literally consists of a component that we can call G of 1, the, the first harmonic, and a component that we can call G of 2, the second harmonic, to finally give us our complete waveform G of t. So we can actually use this tool to look at the waveform of any single harmonic within our signal. A harmonic refers to a single value of n. And we call the value of n equals 1 our fundamental frequency. This is special. This is, in a 60 hertz signal, this is your 60 hertz component. You may have, you may have harmonics on top of that, but this is, this is the base frequency of your signal. And if we start to write this out for a single harmonic, um, just looking at our summation above, 
we can see that it depends on a cosine and a sine term, which we can manipulate a little bit to get into phasor notation. A sine is just simply a cosine that is phase shifted by pi over 2. And at this point, we can use phasor analysis to represent this as the sum of two phasors. Where this quantity right here would be our phasor g of n at harmonic n. And this phasor, again, clearly has a magnitude and an angle. So you can plot this. You can say that g of n consists of a component a of n. Let's, let's do this in blue. That is on the real axis, so this is a of n, and a component that's negative j b of n. So when we get our final phasor, it looks like this. It has a magnitude of g hat, and it's got an angle of phi. When we're talking about a phasor, we're actually talking about a sinusoid. So you can convert this back to the time domain using the expression that we talked about earlier. That is the real part of g of n. So that you get a sinusoid like I've graphed here. The sinusoid has some phase angle, which is phi of n. And it has some peak value, which is g of n. And again, we can convert this, of course, to an RMS quantity as being g of n peak divided by the square root of 2. Next, let's consider the power that's delivered to a load. The instantaneous power is always a product of our voltage and our current. So if we have this hypothetical situation where we have a load circuit that is supplied from a source circuit, and if we were able to measure v of t and i of t, we can know our instantaneous power by multiplying these two quantities. The average power, again, is simply the average of a single signal like we talked about earlier. 1 over t times the integral of these quantities over the period of consideration. <clears throat> we can define the apparent power of any signal as being s equals vrms times irms, and the power factor as our average power divided by our apparent power. So this means that our actual power, or our average power that's drawn, can be considered as the power factor times the apparent power. Power factor must always be less than or equal to 1. You can't have more actual power or average power than you have apparent power. So let's consider the two waveforms that I've shown on the right side. In the first waveform, we can say that our voltage and current have the same phase. In this situation, our power factor is actually just equal to 1. These are sinusoidal quantities where the voltage and current are in phase. In the second case, you can see that there is a clearly a phase difference between these two waveforms, meaning that voltage and current are are out of phase, which gives us a power factor of less than 1. The next quantity of interest is called the displacement power factor. The displacement power factor is defined as the cosine of the angle difference between the voltage and current waveforms. And this is specifically taken at an individual harmonic. Notice the subscript n. This means that at harmonic n, the displacement power factor is the cosine of the angle between the voltage and the current waveform. And remember that we can write this, we can write our voltage and current waveform harmonics in phasor notation as indicated below. If it turns out that we have a pure uh, voltage and current tone, tone, a pure tone means that there's only one harmonic index. We only have n equals 1 we'll have a power factor that's in fact equal to our displacement power factor in that scenario. You can prove this to yourself by evaluating the power expression using a pure cosine for voltage and a cosine for the current that is phase shifted from the voltage. 
Next, let's discuss total harmonic distortion. Say that we have this waveform on the right. Our actual observed current is IS, that's in red, and we've decomposed this into, into harmonic components where I'm showing just the fundamental frequency, IS1, on top of our waveform. So, so in red, we've got our complete current, and in blue, we have our fundamental current. We can define a quantity I distortion as being the difference between the total current and the fundamental component. Total harmonic distortion is defined as being uh, the RMS value of our I distortion divided by the RMS value of our fundamental component. And your textbook shows you how you can calculate this in terms of the complete RMS signal and the RMS of the fundamental. So you can use your scope with an FFT to compute these components and therefore evaluate the total harmonic distortion of a current waveform. THD is important from a design perspective. There are various regulation standards that limit how much total harmonic distortion is allowed. A commonly referenced standard is IEEE. 519. This standard discusses limits on the harmonic distortion based on the stiffness of your power grid. So the idea here is that total harmonic distortion is something that the utility hates. It makes their job of regulating the voltage very difficult. So these standards provide limits on how much harmonic current content you're allowed to have for a specific power grid. And you can read more about this in your textbook.